Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. We're going on a special Halloween science journey today to ancient Egypt. Oh my gosh, we're going to be talking about mummies, aren't we? That's amazing. Yes, we are, but not just any mummies. Did you know that the ancient Egyptians mummified millions of animals? That's a lot of animals. So join us as we climb into ancient tombs with an Egyptologist to discover the secrets of animal mummies. A quick warning before listening, we will be talking about dead animals in this episode, and some of the science gets a bit gross. If that's not for you, then check out one of our past Halloween episodes. Otherwise, let's get ready to explore the ancient world of animal mummies. Salima Ikram has studied ancient Egypt for decades, and she still loves it. I still have to pinch myself. You just think, oh my God, you know, we're crawling into a tomb and suddenly I think, I'm crawling into a tomb and this is so much fun. And look, I'm going to find a mummy now. Wait, so she's finding a mummy, like, right now? I I guess that never gets old. (laughs) It's definitely not just another day at the office. Salima told me what it's like to excavate a tomb. When Alan goes into a tomb, the first thing that one's really worried about, and I always throw a stone in first, is that I don't want to disturb any snakes or scorpions. Yeah, throwing a stone in sounds like a great idea to me. Like, you want to disturb the snakes and scorpions first. After the coast is clear, it's time to have a look around. Salima told me about one excavation she was on when she had to climb down a ladder into a very narrow chamber that had never before been opened. With one look inside, Salima could see that it was filled with mummies. And then I wound up wiggling inside a chamber that was about, you know, three feet high, but two feet were filled with mummies. Wow, so she was like the first person inside this mummy chamber for thousands of years. Yeah, Salima was wearing a hard hat and a mask to keep from breathing in the bad air. She eased into the chamber on her stomach, careful not to damage the mummies. So I was wiggling like a worm in through this entirely dark, unexplored series of chambers filled with animal mummies and trying to make a drawing of the tomb. And I've just got a flashlight, a torch with me, trying to see into the corners and things. Okay, so she's like wiggling, drawing and exploring all at the same time, which sounds to me like an awful lot of multitasking. (laughs) I feel like you'll be just running on sheer adrenaline. Surrounded by mummies. You know, you never know what you're going to see next. And when you put your hand down, what it's going to touch. I didn't even think that that's what exploring a tomb would feel like. And I didn't think about what it would smell like. And it's very smelly. Even with my mask, it was smelly. So what does it smell like? It smells like mummies. And you just have to know what a mummy smells like. Because there isn't anything else that's quite like it. So it smells a bit of resins and a bit of decomposing flesh and a bit of other spices. Once you've smelled mummy, it's a smell you can't forget and it sticks with you. I guess that's the real curse of the mummy right there. You know, you'll be a week later and suddenly you'll smell mummy when you're in the supermarket. And it's really unnerving because you look around going, what? Where? Is she sure that there wasn't a mummy following her to the grocery store? Being like, can you get some tomatoes? (laughs) Salima might actually be excited to see that because she loves to meet new mummies. Well, when you go into a tomb that's not really been explored, it's exciting. You want to see what's there next. And if you think they're going to be a bunch of mummies, I suppose it's like going to a party where you don't know that many people. And they're just potential friends. That's an interesting viewpoint, both for mummy finding and parties. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you should prepare to meet some new mummy animal friends right after this. When you think of a mummy, you might imagine King Tutankhamun, 
the Egyptian boy king whose tomb was excavated a hundred years ago. King Tut's body was wrapped in linen cloth, packed with luxuries for the afterlife, and enclosed within a solid gold coffin. I guess if you have to be enclosed in a coffin, it might as well be solid gold and full of luxuries. (laughs) (laughs) Not every mummy got a solid gold coffin. Because it wasn't just kings and queens or even regular people who were mummified. Animals became mummies too. And Salima is an expert in animal mummies. We excavated a dog catacomb. We don't know how long it was active, whether it was 200 years or 100 years, but we have about 8 million dog mummies there. 8 million. Wait, 8 million dog mummies? That's like, that's like a lot of dog mummies. Yes, that's almost as many dog mummies as there are people who live in New York City right now. But how do you get that many dogs? Because like even just putting them in there, like I feel like that would take a long time. That would be like all the work you'll be willing to do with the dog mummies. <laughs> like, it's like, okay. I don't want to make them. 400,000, 400,001, 400,002, 400,003. I want to know how the archaeologists counted them. <laughs> But what Salima's focus is, is how and why so many animals were mummified in the first place. This is it. One of the things that interests us is how did they get the animals? Because, you know, your pet dog or cat, fine. But when you have them in the millions, we have to try and figure out how many years, how many per year, what was going on. Well, mummification must have been, like, a really huge operation. You'd have to be working around the clock to mummify that many dogs. And where did they all come from? How were they bred? How do, how do they get so many cats and dogs and ibises? So getting the animals, and also there must have been amazing trade routes into Africa to get the baboons. But there were baboon mummies? Like, baboons don't live in Egypt, do they? They don't. Uh, they have green monkeys and baboons that were brought in and were mummified. And also some of them came in as pets. So you've got pet mummies that were baboons. Okay, so there's like crazy exotic pets and crazy numbers of animal mummies. And this just keeps going deeper. So I'm with Salima. What was going on? And that's what we're going to investigate. Being an archaeologist is a bit like being a detective. So Salima starts by gathering all the clues she can, first using the tools of science. You try and figure things out forensically. So by looking at the mummy itself, by doing x-rays of it, CT scans, um, chemically testing the materials that were used to make the mummy, you can sort of figure out how the mummy was made. So wait, we don't know how mummies were made? I thought we did. Well, we have the basics thanks to a Greek historian named Herodotus, who visited ancient Egypt while mummification was a common practice. And he wrote a book about what he learns about Egypt, and he talks about mummification. So using the notes that he made, what little we have from the ancient Egyptian texts, and then you look at the mummies themselves to try and figure out how mummification was carried out. According to Herodotus, Egyptians removed the mushy organs like the brain and intestines and dried out the body over a long period of time. Human beings and animals are mainly water. So if you get rid of the water and some of the fat, then you've got a lovely shell of yourself. And then you are a beautiful mummy that can be wrapped up and then buried. She really makes it sound like a lovely afternoon craft project. Like, uh, let's make some paper airplanes, a lanyard, or, you know, we can mummify something. Well, get out your newspaper and lay it down on the table because (laughs) this is going to be a messy project. No kidding. (laughs) Salima found this out for herself when she and her team decided to do some animal mummy experimentation. I'm assuming the mummies to be all died of natural causes. Yes, they did, and they were donated for mummy science. We did different tests. One rabbit was left to dry, and it bloated up with gases and sort of exploded, and it was not really a pretty sight. Oh, geez. (laughs) That's not good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's why Egyptians did mummification in the first place. 
They believed people and animals needed their bodies in the afterlife. So they literally had to stay in shape. The Egyptians cut down on gas buildup by removing the organs after death. And so that's what Salima and her team did with the second rabbit. And then following Herodotus, we washed it out, we dried it. Herodotus, the Greek historian, had mentioned a substance that's basically salt and baking soda. So Salima took this and filled up little packets of cloth, stuffed them into the body, waited, and finally, they had a very dry bunny mummy. Well, it's a good thing she followed Herodotus's How to Make a Mummy in Five Minutes tutorial. The next question was how to get your mummy to strike the perfect pose. <laughs> right. <laughs> Salima knew that the animals were somehow set up to look as if they were still alive. Cats and dogs were positioned as if they were sitting up with their tails pulled through and tucked along their bellies. And snakes were put into a little spiral often. Um, that's more than a little creepy, but how did they do that? Well, the mummies were really dry, but they had to loosen them up again. Salima experimented using oil. It's tricky because how much oil do you use after you've dried it because you don't want to overly rehydrate, but you do need to have it be a bit flexible so you can position the animal or human being into the right pose. If a mummy wasn't flexible enough, it could crack. <laughs> Think, oh no, you broke the pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> put him back, put him back. <laughs> there were not hot glue guns back then, I'll tell you. I wonder what they did. <laughs> now for the most famous mummification process, the wrapping. The Egyptians used linen ripped into bandages. Then everything was coated in resin to seal. What's resin? Resins are a natural glue like beeswax or tree sap. But Salima didn't know what exactly they were using. So she ran experiments with machines that could identify the chemistry of each mummy. That's the fun of this job is you get to play with these machines that I don't understand and you get to take samples and whiz them up and then suddenly you're like, oh, I can see that it's got this and this and this in it. And then you're like looking at a library to match what those three things would mean that it's resin or beeswax. It's like magic. Okay, so we've got a basic mummy here. Now what? Well, each type of animal has its own mummification challenge. Crocodiles are surprisingly easy, even though they're very big. Cows, cows, they have four stomachs. Oh my God, can you imagine removing those stomachs? Very difficult. Yeah, um, no, I can't imagine even wanting to do that. <laughs> I don't think it's about want as much as need to. <laughs> I guess. If someone was like, can you get all these stomachs out of this cow? And I'd be like, well, I guess. <laughs> Another thing is that not all mummies were a single body. Salima told me about one surprise mummy that looked like the head of a sacred bird called an ibis. And when it was x-rayed, there were lots and lots of ibis mummies in separate packages in that whole thing. But it was wrapped up to look like a big mega ibis it was very weird so there are all kinds of really curious things wait so they just packed a bunch of bird mummies into a bird shaped package um besides being like a super fun craft project why would they do that well that's the next step in archaeological detective work you use the tools of science but then you have to study the culture that created them to figure out why this happened and then you have to look at places where the mummies have been buried and what you find around them. And that might tell you about the religious ideas that made people do this. Why were they doing these things? What did it mean for an ancient Egyptian to give a mummy as an offering, a mummified animal? Wait, an offering of a mummified animal? What does that mean? Good question. Egyptologists have studied pictures and writing on tomb and temple walls that described the religious beliefs of ancient Egypt, and that told them about offerings to the gods. There were animals that the Egyptians believed were sacred to a particular god, and they believed that the god, when the god wanted, could enter the body of the animal and sort of be there amongst living people. 
Huh, so like a dog could be like the living form of a god. Yeah, each god or goddess had an animal that went along with it. So cats, for example, were sacred to the goddess Bastet, who is the goddess of motherhood and love and beauty and sort of self-indulgence and a variety of other things. Egyptians who wanted help from Bastet could give her a gift or an offering. A mummified cat was the greatest gift that you could give. And often the Egyptians must have thought that because the cat had been a living creature, it was more powerful than anything made of wood or stone or metal. So lots of people would have wanted to make the most powerful offering to the gods that they could, and that's probably why they made so many animal mummies. Animal mummification was definitely a serious business. And each finding of a tomb or strange mummy gives archaeologists a little bit more to go on. We come up with ideas as to why the Egyptians did what they did, what they were thinking, what particular aspect of their life or culture or belief something was a manifestation of. Okay, well, so now can we say that we know how and why there were so many animal mummies? I think it's very difficult to say, yes, we know, ever, because there are more than 3,000 years between us, and we don't have the whole picture. It's like you're doing a puzzle where half the pieces are missing and you don't know what the picture is on the box. But are there more puzzle pieces left to find? I mean, like, more mummies, tombs, and maybe some powerful magical amulets that can give powers? (laughs) Apart from the amulets, I'm sure that there are. Oh, there is about 70% at least still left to discover. I mean, some of it's going to be hard to get to because people are living on top of it. But there are also large parts of the desert which contain tombs that have yet to be found. But there's still a lot more potential. All right, that's all I needed to hear. Let's book our tickets to Cairo. I've got a shovel somewhere. (laughs) I'll go put it in a bag. (laughs) I feel like with that plan, we might end up as mummies ourselves. (laughs) Now that you've explored the incredible diversity of animal mummies, it's time to make your own. Oh, I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry, Marshall. We're not going to ask our listeners to actually mummify anything. Just draw an animal mummy. Oh, wow. That sounds a lot cleaner. (laughs) All you'll need is paper and something to draw or color with. Some animal mummies had faces painted onto them or were wrapped up in beautifully woven cloth patterns. So get creative. And send us your drawings when you're done. We'd really love to see them. Thanks to Dr. Salima Ikram, Distinguished University Professor at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. We're participating in Nat Geo Kids' podcast party, Ancient Egypt, in honor of the 100th anniversary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Together with other kids' podcasts, we're making episodes about ancient Egypt. If you're interested in listening to more, check out Greeking Out. Greeking Out's new episode is on Akhenaten, who's one of the most interesting pharaohs in all of Egyptian history. He tried to create some myths of his own and completely change Egyptian religion, and he just happens to be King Tut's dad. We'll definitely be listening to that episode, and if you want to hear more from Salima about her adventures exploring ancient Egyptian tombs, we'll have a bonus interview episode for our Patreon subscribers at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll have free resources to learn more about animal mummies on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this episode and created the arts. Elliot Hajaj is our production assistant. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. In our next episode, we'll be asking... How do toilets work? Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery.